off, off the beaten path is, is um, it kind of defines who, who I am and, you know, my coaching journey. It's been, it's been a lot of fun, but it has been off the beaten path. It's a good, good terminology for my journey. I, I've wanted to coach since I was eight years old. I've always wanted to coach. I asked for a dry erase board for Christmas when I was eight. And you know, <laughs> I love my parents were probably glad because we didn't have a lot of money and a dry erase board isn't too expensive. So that was, that was like the one gift. Hi, I'm Corey Baldwin. I'm Daniel Bowles. And I'm Dan Searle. And it's time for a new episode of Off the Beaten Path. This is the podcast for basketball coaches living in obscurity, working in obscurity, even those who have made it to Mobile and out of obscurity. <laughs> hey, it's a place for storytelling. Some of the stories are true. Learning, connecting, reconnecting and uh, food for thought, and my favorite, food for the belly. Today, we welcome Coach Richie Riley, the head coach at South Alabama. And we really appreciate you, Richie. I know tomorrow starts uh, recruiting, and you're taking time out of your busy schedule. So we'll jump right in it. Tell us how in the world did you get involved with college basketball? What got you started? Yeah, first of all, it's a pleasure to be on. Um, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, me, and, me and CB go way back, and you know, when he asked me if I was interested in doing it, I was, um, I was excited about coming on. Yeah. I, I always wanted my, my whole journey is a little bit different off, off the beaten path is, is, um, it kind of defines who, who I am and, you know, my coaching journey. It's been, it's been a lot of fun, but it has been off the beaten path. It's a good, good terminology for my journey. I, I've wanted to coach since I was eight years old. I've always wanted to coach. I asked for a dry erase board for Christmas when I was eight. And you know, <laughs> I love my parents were probably glad because we didn't have a lot of money and a dry erase board isn't too expensive. So that was that was like my number one gift. Um, I played through high school, played in college, I walked on to Eastern Kentucky, but I always wanted to coach. And I was coaching AAU basketball when I was like 16 or 17, uh, coaching 10 and under. And and I, you know, I, I always thought I'd be a high school coach, to be honest with you. I have to grow up in Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky high school basketball is king, you know, and mm. with my Golden West State Championship, that's what I wanted to do. And um, I started out as a volunteer assistant for the freshman team at Madison Central High School there in Richmond, Kentucky, where I went to school at, at Eastern Kentucky. And um, I was coaching the summer in Georgetown College, um, a guy named Jason Mays, who's a high school coach in Kentucky now. Asked me if I was interested in if I was interested in college coaching. And I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, I'd I'd love to do that. So I volunteered at Georgetown College um, and really enjoyed that. And once I volunteered, I knew college was my passion because of the recruiting piece and the relationship piece. And, you know, it was, you know, I just wanted to be a college basketball coach at some some level or another. And and from there. I got my first paying job, if you call it that, at Hawaii Pacific University and um, in Honolulu, Hawaii. I was making like $8,500 a year. So, again, I didn't come <laughs> for much money and I I wasn't going to turn the opportunity down because, number one, it was the only opportunity that I got. You know, I didn't I didn't have a bunch of job offers out here and I took it. I went over there and I was like a fish out of water, man. You know, I I was like had never been even remotely close to that far west that's as far as you can go but I hadn't even been to California before I went out there and ran a credit card up to six grand um, just to survive and made made it work and the guy I was working for there Kelly Wells who's athletic director at Moorhead State now um, he was my boss he's the head coach and he got the job at Pikeville College which we were back in Kentucky it's like two hours from my hometown which was a super blessing. Um, came back there. I was there for three years with him. Um, learned a lot as, as an NAI assistant year, there's only one on our staff. There was, you know, and I, I coached the guys, did the scouts, recruited, drove a van to the games, did the laundry, um, swept the floors. I did everything for, for three years. It was really, it's really good for me. You know, I learned how to do a lot of things. Um, so from there, I took Arkansas Fort Smith, hey. Coach, let's be before we get too far down the path, right? We're following right. along, but we got to go back. I think we each have one question at least to to catch up. All right. Eight years old, you know you want to coach. Why? Was there a teacher? Was there a coach? Was there something on TV? What what was in the brain that you remember? 
That's a great question. Um, I don't come from a lineage of coaches. My, my dad was an electrician. He's retired now. Um, I didn't have any coaches in my family. I just developed like a passion for, for sports in general. Mm-hmm. And I, what attracted my, you know, my attention more so than anything were, were the coaches. Um, I grew up when Patino, when Coach Patino was at Kentucky. And that was the the mecca of college hoops, you know, when he was there, when he resurrected that program. And I was a young kid and it just kind of really drew my attention more to, to that than, than the players, which is weird. I don't really know why, you know, I used to, I used to play like with my GI Joe men, I'd play basketball games. I'd use a coffee mug as the goal and we would play. (laughs) And while I was playing, I'd keep a scorebook, you know, I'd keep the points and the rebounds and all that. And, um the same thing when I was playing hoops in the backyard with my friends I always wanted to diagram some type of play that we were going to run I know it got on their nerves they just wanted to shoot balls and hope but it it just kind of I had just had a passion for it early on and it really is an odd thing I think it was just a blessing that you know I, early on that's what I really wanted to do and you know I've been able to achieve that so I get to live my dream every day which there's not a lot of people that get to say that um, that's that's awesome, right? You know what your passion is, you pursue it, and and here you are, right? Head coach, uh, coaching them up, recruiting, building those relationships. I love it. Yeah, it's fun. I can't believe I get paid to do it most of the time. I get to get to do something that I would do for free, and I get to make a living out of it. So it's it's been it's been super fun. What did your family and friends say when you went all the way to Hawaii? Uh, you you really gambled. I mean, what, what did they think you were crazy? Yeah, I burned the boats. You know, that's my that's my, <laughs> that's my deal. I burned the boats. It was the first time in my career I've had multiple times where that's been the case. But you know, my dad again. I came from a small southeastern Kentucky town, and the idea that I was going to number one go to Hawaii was very outlandish. But number two, that I was going to go out there for eight thousand dollars a year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with no financial backing it wasn't like I was coming from a bunch of wealth where you know somebody's gonna take care of me I had to find a way to do it and luckily somebody gave me a credit card I paid it off since then but yeah I was able to get a credit <laughs> card and that was to pay my rent and to eat it's so expensive to live out here so my family thought I was crazy my friends thought I was crazy um they, the people that were closest to me like my best friends at the time they understood because they had seen me volunteering at Georgetown um, before that. And that was a, that was a 45 minute drive one way. So I would drive up as soon as I got out of class at Eastern Kentucky and work all day, all the way to, you know, 10, 10 at night. And then I would drive home and go to class and do the same thing every single day. So they knew I was passionate about it. And, you know, it was an opportunity that I had to take, you know, I was 21 years old and um, I just went over there and, yeah, luckily I was only there for like nine months, 10 months. <laughs> I, I, oh, I would, I, I'd still be paying off to this day if I would have coached there for three or four years. You know, telling how much <laughs> that I would have accumulated. I don't know. Uh, I don't want to get us stuck in Hawaii too much, but I know for everybody that's kind of like the, the wow factor. But um, so I was an assistant at Southern Tech in the early 2000s. So the Pikeville and the Georgetown, that brings back some bad memories. Um, <laughs> but uh, for you, going from basketball crazy Kentucky to Hawaii like like what was that just the cultural shift of basketball is everything to I can't imagine Hawaii had quite the same uh, same excitement not quite the same feel out there they don't they don't <laughs> love us out there quite as much as as we did in the bluegrass state but it was it was a culture shock to be honest because again I come from this small rural town where you know it's just country man like you're just living and you go out to Hawaii and number one, you think about Hawaii, you see it on TV. I grew up seeing movies out there and shows and all this stuff. And you, you think about Waikiki beach there in Honolulu and that's all you see on TV. I only went to Waikiki beach probably two or three times. I lived in the city of Honolulu and it's, it's very structured like any major city um, that you see. There's a ton going on with crime and there's a ton, you know, just a lot of things going on. And then you're smashed on that island where they squeeze a lot of people in a small space. So the traffic was terrible. Um, <laughs> everything everything was way different than you would imagine before you go over there. That's a beautiful place. I 
I, um, I took a lot from my time there and enjoyed it. Um, but it, it was very different than the experience that most people think when you say that you worked in Hawaii for a year, they expect it to be a little different. Okay. All right. So you, you end up going to Pikeville. So now take us from Pikeville. You said you, you ended up getting another move after three or four years. What was that? Yeah. So I was at Pikeville. I met my wife there, Jess. Um, she was coach on the women's team and I was coach on the men's team. And when you're at that level, you travel together on the buses and, you know, you see each other all the time. That's how we got to know each other. So that was, that's a cool part of my journey is that's how I met my wife. Um, but I, after three years, I, I started to, again, as you go in this profession or any profession, probably you start to get out, you see more things and your dreams become bigger than they were when they first started. So I had a dream. I wanted to be a division one assistant. And I felt like in order to do that, I had to get somewhere in the NCAA realm, you know, just for that experience. Cause NAI is very different than NCAA when it comes to rules and it comes to all the things that go into it. But so I took a division two assistance job with Josh Newman at Arkansas Fort Smith. And um, it was a great opportunity. And I, I took it, I got out there and um, they just turned Division Two. They were a powerhouse junior college. Sonny Weems and those guys. When Doc Sadler was there, Jeremy, Kyle, all those guys. Um, and coach, how'd you end up going there? Did you know somebody? Did you apply to something that was posted in the NCAA news? Uh, what was the what was the tie-in to get there? I did. You know what's weird about my journey is we continue to get into it. All the jobs that I got as an assistant coach, I had zero previous relationship with the head coach. Really? Which is very that odd. Is, that yeah. is odd. Yeah. It's very, very odd. And that was, that was kind of my path, off the beaten path. I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> kind of different, you know. And um, so I, I just kind of called some people that knew him and got an opportunity to interview, and I got the job. And I get down to Fort Smith. I get my apartment. Um, I'm there about – I was actually living with Hank Plonia. You know, Hank, that's assistant Western Kentucky. I was at Indian Hills. We were living together. Yeah assistant too at the time there and um I was there like two and a half weeks and I got a call from Cliff Ellis at Coastal Carolina and didn't know him at all um we got connected through Brian Cloman who's the who's the assistant coach at College of Charleston one of the best recruiters in the country um Brian's phenomenal and um he had a relationship with him and coach was looking for a young guy that could really recruit junior college at the time and recruit the transfers you know there was a portal back then but and at pikeville that's that's what i did you know we right. they, they won a national championship the year after i left um and we that was that was our target you know those areas and so anyway coach coach ellis says hey you know i've heard great things i'd love to interview for the job and i said well i just took this job at fort smith i don't you know I, but i want to be division one so it was really awkward. I went to Josh Newman and asked him, hey, can I interview for the job? And he was like, if you interview, you better get it. And, <laughs> but, and I didn't have a job coming back. So I thought about it, talked to Jess, who was my girlfriend at the time. She's my wife now. And um, I, I rolled the dice, turned in my letter of resignation, drove hmm. 14 hours from Fort Smith, Arkansas to Conway, South Carolina, um, and interviewed. It was a weekend interview. And coach was having his his charity golf tournament so Tubby Smith was there all kinds of like legends were there for his charity golf tournament so that was my interview and <laughs> uh, luckily he hired me I'm still so grateful to him for the opportunity and he hired me and um, so I went from employed to unemployed for about 20 24 48 maybe 72 hours to to reaching my at that time ultimate goal and dream of being a division one assistant in a two week window. How about that? <laughs> yeah, it was a crazy two weeks. It was really strange. <laughs> um, but you know, when you're young like that, I was 25. When you're young like that, you can just kind of roll the dice. I didn't have kids yet. I didn't have a wife. I could roll the dice. And I was pretty confident back then too, you know, that, that I could go in there and win the job and I was able to do it. And I, I'm, Coach is one of my mentors. He's he's been unbelievable. We're in the same league now. We've coached against each other like eight times now, I think, um, which is a little crazy for me every time I do it. I think he's number eleven in the country right now in career wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
He's he's a legend. He deserves to be in the Hall of Fame one day. Coach, do you have any uh, good Cliff Ellis stories that you can share on here? That are uh... I got I got <laughs> a lot of them, but one that sticks. I got two. I, I'll give you two quick ones because I know we're cut on time here. Um, one of them, the first recruiting trip he and I ever took together, I was driving and he was riding with me and, you know, he's riding, he, he tells you a million stories. So he's just talking. I'm not paying attention. I'm listening to him, I'm not paying attention to speed limit. So I get pulled over. I'm going, I don't know, that's probably going 65 or 70 in a 45. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my goodness, like, this is the first time I'm with this dude. You get pulled over. As soon as I, as soon as the sirens hit, we pull, I start pulling over. He says, oh, we're all good. We're all good, buddy. We're all good. And I'm like, what? I'm like, Coach, I was going like 70 in a 45. And uh, he said, just tell them who you work for, buddy. It'll be all good. I'm like, Coach, I'm in South Carolina right now, man. And But he was able to talk. He was able to talk the guy out of a ticket. I didn't get a ticket. He just started talking. And and the guy, you know, just Coach has a way about him where um, he just – people love him, man. So we got out of the ticket. And um, so I was thankful for that too. The other, the other story is, you know, when I got there, he was so hard on me about the type of dudes I recruited. I mean, he wanted power five level dudes. That's back when we were in the big South, we played in a little bitty gym held about 1500 old. And he was so hard on me. It helped me so much as a coach though, because he raised the bar so high that I learned to really recruit guys that were above the level where I was at instead of settling. And, um, but the funniest one we ever had, we had a junior college kid that we recruited a uh, really good player. And, you know, I worked my tail off to get him and, and coach had never really seen him play like that. The kid was way up in Illinois coach never went up there. So he gets there and the, you know, we started fall workouts and the kid is like a nervous wreck. He's like structure was not his thing. And, and coach brings me in because I had I had praised this kid. I told him he's going to turn our whole thing around. You know, he's going to take us to NCAA, all this stuff. He's and coach, coach went off on me. He said, he said, you missed. You know, there's a few choice words that I won't say. But he he, he let me have it. And um, so we get to the first scrimmage. We're scrimmaging Campbell. It's closed-door scrimmage. He's not playing the kid. And we, we're getting beat pretty good. And – you know, finally he just throws him in. The kid goes off for like twenty. Uh, nothing scripted, no play, no no. He just could he had to he had put the ball in the basket. And at anyway, from that day forward, the kid, best player in the league. He had twenty two at LSU. He beat them. He averaged like twenty something. Um, phenomenal player. And to this day, we still laugh about it. He he tells he, he apologizes still and tells me that tells me that I was right on that one. <laughs> oh, hey, he apologizes. He'll give you credit. That's, 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 that's good. So, that's something in his older age. Back at, you know, when I worked for him a few years ago, that would never happen. Now, now. Right. He's to do that. right. Hey, so you're sitting on the bench in the scrimmage, Campbell, and your guy's going off. Are you fist uh, fist pumping under the bench there to yourself? You're like, I told you, coach. What, what were you feeling in that minute? There? I was hitting other assistants. Don Hogan, who's a really good friend of mine. Um, and I was hitting him. He was associate head coach because he had seen him. I took him up to Illinois yeah. to see him. And uh, he knew how good he was. So we were all trying okay, to talk. I told to you. <laughs> and uh, the rest was history, though. And it's an example I use with my players throughout the years is like, Listen, the cream always rises. It doesn't, you know, you come in and you have bad days early on, you know, trying to get adjusted and you get down on yourself and your confidence is low. If you just keep working, the cream always rises. That's the ultimate example of that. I love it. All right. So, so where do you go from after Coastal Carolina? So I was at Coastal for two years and um, we went 56 and 13, um, two championships, had an unbelievable run. I don't know if I'll ever be part of a run like that again. We won 28 games back to back years. Um, and then I, I got an opportunity to go back as a top assistant at Eastern Kentucky. And again, that's where I'm from. Um, my family's 40 minutes from there. And I went back and, and we were bought a house. I was married by then. We didn't have any kids yet, but I bought a house and plan on being there. You know, my goal, my end goal at the time was to be there and hopefully be the head coach at Eastern Kentucky one day. That was the dream. And um, after after that first year, I um, went to the Final Four and it was down in New Orleans that year. And I was I was in I was sleeping, 
And I woke up, this was a Friday morning, I think. And I woke up and I had a voicemail on my phone and I was like, didn't know the number. So I checked it and it was Jared Hass, who's the head coach at Stanford now. And he had just got the UAB job. He was assistant for Coach Williams at North Carolina. Um, and he had just got the UAB job. And I remember seeing it on the flight down that he got it on hoop dirt or one, one of those. And I was like, man, that's a weird hire, man. He's, he's a, from North Carolina. He's going to go to UAB, which is, you know, and he knew that he needed somebody. He didn't know me at all. I'd never spoke to him in my life. But he knew that he needed somebody that could recruit junior college that – could really recruit down the south and um so he he asked mike ellis who used to be over villa seven he's an agent now um the, the famous villa seven and mm -hmm. mike and i had a relationship and he told him that was the first name and i appreciate to mike so coach called me so i interviewed with coach twice and he offered me the job and UAB with the, the basketball tradition they had, you know, when I was growing up, they upset Kentucky. I remember watching it. I probably shed some tears. Um, and so it was like a huge opportunity. So we left uh, Richmond and went to Birmingham for two years. Uh, had had a really good two years there. Kind of got the program up and, up and going. It's fun. Worked with some great people. Coach Hass is one of the best human beings you could ever come across in your life. Um, and I had a fun two years there, and and then we headed to Clemson. We um, and again, I didn't know Coach Brownell, <laughs> and Jeff Newbauer, who I worked for at Eastern Kentucky, was good friends with him, and he he called Coach. It was a weird time because I took that job. It was in September. Earl Grant got the College of Charleston job in September, and um, so Coach had an opening on his staff, and you know he wanted hey, coaches. Coach Coach Brownell is. You know, one of, one of the most underappreciated coaches in the country. He's as good as there is anywhere. Um, just a phenomenal coach. He's done a great job there. And um, he, when he interviewed me, he put me on the whiteboard, and I was on there for an hour, hour and a half. Um, and he's just, you know, bang, 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 question after question. And because he wanted a well-rounded coach. And as a minority coach in this profession, so refreshing to me. You know, how, how as a minority in the profession you climb a lot of times is your recruiting prowess, how you recruit the players you get. And, you know, that was a huge part of me getting the job, obviously. But he valued my ability to coach the game. And he helped me really prepare to be a head coach. And, you know, I'm so, so thankful that I got to work for him for two years. Man, so how in the world did that feel going from using a credit card to get a job to now you're an ACC? assistant i mean it's the king of the kings right there it, it was i always wanted to coach in the acc it was i grew up like i said i wanted to be a coach i used to watch them acc games it was carolina duke clemson florida state whoever and um i i i remember when i got to clemson i, I walked in my office for the first time and there was these huge nike duffel bags they were full of gear like just gear on top of gear and i remember looking at just like <laughs> We came, we came a long way. And, and sometimes when you go on these journeys, you got to, number one, you got to be thankful because, you know, Lord bless you or something like that. You, it's, there's only one reason for that. But then you got to just sit back and reflect and see where you came from because it wasn't that long ago I was in Hawaii and you know, <laughs> didn't have enough money to buy, it, buy a carton of milk, you know, or, or I was at Pikeville doing laundry, driving buses, um, doing all those things. And, to be on the private flights and all the things we we're doing at Clemson was, was, it was a really cool moment. And then, then the other cool part about coaching at that level, I think I got there. I was like 30 when I got there, maybe you're 30, I think. And I grew up idolizing all these coaches and now I was getting to coach against them. You know, I, I'll never forget when we played Louisville, I had the scout and I was sitting there yelling out everything they were doing and looking down the bench and Patino was down there on that one knee with that famous pose, just like that. And I was just like, a couple of times, I think I just kind of dazed. And I was like, Whoa, like, you know, Rick <laughs> down there, dude, and I'm actually coaching against him. Um, but Coach K and Coach Williams and Bayheim, there were so many guys in the ACC at that time who were, you know, on Mount Rushmore coaching. <laughs> before, before we leave Clemson, um, kind of backtrack real quick. 
Um, you talked about the Villa, the Villa Seven. Will you kind of explain that for people that aren't familiar with that experience of what that was? Yeah, the Villa Seven was one of the one of the major creations of college basketball. I don't know that like there is no Villa Seven now. There's Next Chair. There's um, Top Connect. I think everybody's trying to kind of duplicate what Villa Seven was, and I don't know that it can ever be duplicated. When you look at the alumni list that came out of Villa Seven, that are head coaches now and the success that that has been shown from that grouping of people, it's pretty amazing. So Villa 7 was sponsored by Nike, and Mike Ellis, who was the associate athletic director at VCU at the time, uh, kind of headed it up, um, him and Norwood Teague, um, a lot of, the, and a few other people. But so basically they took the top, what they felt like were the top 50 assistants in the country. And you would have a weekend meeting, you know, like, 48 72 hours and they would have a ton of athletic directors come in you got a chance to talk to them and build a relationship with them they would have guest speakers they would do a speed dating deal where you got in front of an athletic director for five ten minutes and they would ask you questions um and it was absolutely phenomenal i i did it i think three three or four times one time it was out in portland oregon at the nike headquarters which was really cool um, it was in Indianapolis one time, the NCAA headquarters. It's been different places, but that that helped me tremendously. Mike Ellis was a huge advocate for me to help me in this profession. And I think everybody needs as much help as they can get. I think, you know, and I was fortunate to have some people in my corner that really helped me. Um, but that, but that's what it was. And you, it's it, when you look at guys now that are head coaches, it's like. I mean, I'd say 75% of those guys that are my age or higher were in, in one time in Bill seven. So it was, it was a monumental thing for, for coaches like me at the time. How about that? You get the training, you get the chance to network all there in one place, and you're meeting all the other people who are going to be those head coaches down the road. Uh, that's yeah, you, know, you, know, you know, the part that's crazy about Bill is Mike, Mike Ellis headed that up. And Mike, Mike represents a lot of guys now. He's an agent for coaches. Um, but when Shaka, when Shaka was an assistant at Clemson, and then he went to Florida, he went to Florida with Billy Donovan. He was there for a year. He had been at Villa Seven and he impressed those guys so much when BCU opened, when Anthony Grant left and went to Alabama, that you know, that everybody thought that was one of the hottest jobs in the country. I mean, Capel had left to go to Oklahoma. Anthony Grant had left to go to Alabama and who they were going to hire. And Shaka at the time was like 32, 33. And through Villa 7, he had impressed those guys so much because BCU was basically running Villa 7 that that they hired him as a 32, 33-year-old, one of the most wow. covered jobs in the country. And they look like, and they came out looking like a genius. He took him to the Final Four. <laughs> And you know, obviously he's one of the biggest stars in our profession, but they were ahead of the curve on that because they had had him in that program and knew how good he was where the rest of the country didn't know yet. Those are some good behind the scenes stories. And because uh, you do, you see it come across the wire. Jack a smart hired at 32. Um, there's a reason for it. It all happened beforehand. Okay. Uh, they made a great I've got to step out to go to practice here in a, in a second, but I got two Clemson questions for you. One, you're up at the whiteboard. What is one of the things that coach asked you to draw up or break down? Are we breaking the press? Are we taking on uh, Duke's offense? What are we doing? Yeah. Coach asked a, a plethora of everything. You know what the, the thing coach loved to talk about was, was what are you going to do on a miss? He loved it. Part of it's because he's such a great defensive mind. To me, he's the best defensive coach. And it means it doesn't get any better. And he, he, he said, what do you, what do you want to do on a miss? So I would diagram what we got. We'd flow into offense on a miss. He wanted to see my best out of bounds under um, action side out. Uh, if I had three sets that I could install, what would they be? And, you know, you come in blind. It's not like he sent me an itinerary of what he was going to ask me. So <laughs> you had to think pretty quick on your feet. And thankfully, I did a good enough job. He gave me gave me an opportunity. But it was it was pressure-packed. And I think All it's right. a good way to interview. I do some of that now when I interview guys, is put them on the whiteboard and, you know, have them see what they can come up with under a pressure situation, not knowing the questions are going to be asked. 
which is what happens in a game. And I think you kind of answered my next question there as you described uh, Bernal, but uh, why is he underappreciated? Why did you uh, define him as one of the most underappreciated coaches? Yeah, he just doesn't get the credit he deserves. I used to tell him that. I still tell him that. I'm very candid with him. He's a great friend of mine. Um, I think the fact that the ACC is so tough, I think it's just so tough. And, you are you know, Clemson – Clemson has had, he's took them to the tournament, but everybody in this generation wants that. They're, they want something, that, that instant gratification, you know, no matter how hard the job is, no matter what the situation is, it's never good enough. That's the social media. And, and sometimes people have, you know, I feel like underappreciated him with what he's been able to do there. The consistency, number one, of his program and the culture that's built there, just phenomenal kids. And, you know, he's caught a few bad breaks last year. I thought oh, really? that for them to not get in the NCAA tournament right. was just pleasing me. And he's had two or three years that have been that. And I think a lot of it is that underappreciation. Because a lot of times when, like, I worked in that league for two years. You know, I know a lot of those guys, obviously, now. And I coach a lot of ball. And um, the headliners in that league are, you know, there's Hall of Famers everywhere. And coach is – as far as a tactician is as good as any of them and he doesn't get that reputation. And so I think it's unfair. I mean, I think, I think he's as good a ball coach as there is in the country, you know, and it, it goes, you know, one at Wilmington, one at Wright state, he's one at Clemson. I think, I think he's drastically underappreciated and, um, and it may, maybe, maybe because I've got a behind the scenes, look at how good he is, you know, working, working for him for two years. But he, he's a heck of a ball coach. There ain't many ball coaches out there that you could say is better than him. Yep, that makes sense. And from the inside, you seeing it, but also they've won enough games year in and year out in that tough league. So it all kind of comes together. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. All right. So now take us from ACC. You take even a bigger gamble probably than you did going out to Hawaii with the credit card. Tell us what your next step was. Yeah. Super burn the boats moment on that one was, um, you know, I, I had interviewed, not a lot of people know this necessarily. I had interviewed at Northern Kentucky um, after my first year at Clemson. And I was like 30, 31, I think 32, 31 and 32 and uh, felt real good about it. We interviewed the first stage in Indianapolis at the final four. And I got to the finals, which was me, John Brandon, and Laval Jordan. At the time, Laval was assistant at but I mean at Michigan, and John was assistant at Alabama. He's actually interim head coach um, at the end of the year there. And I felt good about it. Went in, interviewed, and just got crushed. I didn't get it. I'm talking about it, it was the biggest disappointment as far as coaching goes in my whole life. Mm -hmm. So I came out of that experience. Um better after it you know after after those wounds had healed a little bit and so the next year I was really hungry to be a head coach coach Brownell used to give me a hard time he'd be like man you just well you're just so hungry to be a head coach man once you become a head coach you got to be a head coach the rest of your life you know he would he would, <laughs> he would want me to take my time but so Nickel stayed open and I had, had no clue where Nickel State was didn't know anything about it and I'm a hoops junkie and didn't know anything about them and I get on the website. I see they're in Thibodeau, Louisiana. So I'm like, that's in the South. I knew it was in the South somewhere. Um, they're in the South and conference. That was the time Stephen F was really good. Um, and I was like, man, really good, you know, pretty good league, you know. And I look, I look on their directory, and there's a guy. His name's Andrew Kearney. He's a chief deputy AD down there now. But he was the compliance guy back then at Nichols. And I had recruited him at Hawaii Pacific. He's from Michigan. <laughs> I'd recruit him. So I track his number down and call him and say, hey, man, I'd love to be the head coach at Nick. He's like, what? So he tells his boss, Rob Bernardi, um, who's at UL Monroe on their uh, in their athletics department now. And so I get a phone call with, with Rob and I and I said, hey, man, I'd love to be there. And he's like, why would you want to be here? You know, you're in the ACC. You take a drastic pay cut. And I said, I, I just, I, I want to be a head coach and I feel like I, I know that I can win there. So he calls me back, tells me they're going to hire somebody with local ties, um, you know, that's associated with the state of Louisiana. 
And I, I told him I had nothing to lose at that point. I told him, I said, well, keep doing the same thing you're doing, then hire hire whoever that is. But if not, bring me in there and I'll fix this whole thing for you, <laughs> which was really good <laughs> to say. But I didn't have anything to lose. I mean, I, if he said no, he says no, and I stay at Clemson and, you know, so on and so forth. So so what happened was he, I guess that hit home for him, and he, he brought me down for an interview. So my wife and I go down there. We take our my oldest son reese with us and he's a little bitty at the time and we're driving the swamps man it's like swampy it's <laughs> never seen anything like it and we get down there we interview they tell me the budget all the things it's going to be and it's like top five worst budget in all of america <laughs> and i'm going to take i think it was roughly 75 or eighty thousand dollar pay cut i'm going to take a cut to go wow. and i got another kid on the way Rock was going to be born in like August of that year. And um, I, so I tell him I can't do it. I, I'm not going to be able to do it. And I go and recruit. It was in the spring and I go and recruit in Atlanta and I'm in the gym. I'm looking around at all these coaches that I know, some of them I don't know. And I'm thinking, man, you know how hard it is to be a division one head coach. So I called Jess and I said, Hey, they really want me down there. I'm going to take it. She didn't like it at all. She was she loved Clemson. She didn't like it, that at all. And obviously it put our family in a financial, you know, big difference. I mean, it's a, a big difference. And so, but she's, you know, we're best friends and she's so supportive. She 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 cowboyed up and did it. And, you know, I'm so thankful. I, I told her I'll never do that again. I haven't. I've had a few other opportunities. <laughs> she didn't want to do it. And I said, no, we're not, we're not doing it. I told her I would never do it through again. So we went down there and I told her we would win and get out. And, you know, we won championship in year two. And um, then I got to South Alabama. And what a lot of what a lot of people, I'm sure you want to question too about Nichols, but what a lot of people don't understand about South Alabama was it had been like a dream job for me for a long time. And that's just not people think it's like a recruiting pitch. It's not. When I took the Nichols job, you had to drive from Clemson, you had to come through Mobile. And we stopped and stayed at Spring Hill Suites in Mobile. And me and my wife and Reese drove up and looked at the campus. And I said, man, I would just give anything to coach at this place right here. And, you know, God works in mysterious ways. I, I got to do that uh, two years later. I'm still here now. Man, that's unbelievable. Unbelievable. What, uh, when you left uh, Clemson, what what was some of the advice uh, coach gave you on the way out? Because I'd imagine he probably pulled you aside before you left, just from sounds like y'all's relationship. He he did, yeah. He he and basically good luck because he thought it was <laughs> impossible. Like everybody else. I remember all the guys that I looked up to at the time, whether it was Shaka <laughs> Smart or Brad Brownell or a bunch of these guys. Um, they were like, and I don't know if I would do that. Uh, you'll get a better than that. But I, I I didn't think I could. And a lot of those guys, they didn't come, you know, from the same path I did. Like we've talked right. about on here. I mean, wasn't that long ago I was driving buses, doing all those things. And it's like, I, somebody's going to let me be a division one head coach. Like I'm doing it. I don't care what the money yeah. is. I don't care where, where it's at. I don't care what the budget is. And we had a $1,000 recruiting budget for the whole budget, $1,000. Um, so I fundraised like crazy, just anything to help us be able to have a chance to win. And, um, but coach, coach Brownell was always really good to me in the fact that he instilled a lot of trust and he, he helped me become a more confident coach because of the way that he treated me and the responsibility he gave me. So he told me that I was ready. And, um, you know, I asked him on the way out, could I steal one of his guys and Austin Clanch is who I stole. He was our video guy at Clemson. And, um, I took him to Nichols with me and he was huge in that transition. He ended up being the head coach there and had a great run, and now he's assistant for Nate at Alabama. But yeah, That's all. It, it, it's been it was really it was really a crazy time because everybody was looking at me like I was crazy. It's already enough pressure when you become a head coach, but then when all these eyes were looking <laughs> at you, people you know, like you start to doubt. Like I mean, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but I'd already burned the boats then, so I was I was down in Thibodeau. I had to figure it out. And fortunately, we recruited some really good players, and I had some great guys on my staff and we were able to win enough. Do you think uh, you being, uh, and you kind of mentioned it then, but you know, a lot of ACC, SEC guys, when they become head coaches and if they go down, sometimes it can be harder because they've been 
silver spoon kind of guys, maybe played in the NBA, whatever, whatever. Whereas you had already done a lot of back work in the lower levels. Do you think that helped you a lot at, at Nichols? I think a ton. I mean, that's a great point. I was, I was ready for that and nothing really caught me that much off guard because I had operated under those budgets before, you know, you know, I'd been at, you know, essentially I didn't, I wasn't an ACC really dude. You know, a lot of these guys played at that level and all they've right. done is coach at that level. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, really comfortable with doing, doing more with less. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like you being a junior college coach, I think some of the best guys, you've seen so many junior college coaches make the transition from from there to Division One, and they've had a ton of success because they wear so many hats. You know, you, you do so many things in your position because you don't have a million guys running around to do all the little things. You got to do a lot of those yourself, and I was the same way, and I think that really helped me be able to win quick. You know, I think – and and my approach too was that I had to win. Like mm -hmm. I had no choice. I just took my family from Clemson in a really comfortable position to Thibodeau, Louisiana, where everybody's pretty uncomfortable. And I had to find mm -hmm. and and we were able to do that. All Coach, right. once you uh, once you got to Nichols, what was your uh, you know your welcome to head coaching moment? You know they always say NBA rookies they have that welcome to the NBA moment. It might be getting dunked on by LeBron or whatever it is. Did you have a moment where it was like, wow, I'm here? <laughs> I'd say, you know, I, I was I was fortunate enough, the first game I ever coached at Nichols, we played at Boston College. They paid us 90 to come up there, and we went in there and beat them. We upset them. And it was, you know, it was all over Twitter, and all these guys were – it was like – I was sitting there thinking, like, man, this is not as hard as everybody acts like it is. This isn't that bad, you know, and – but then I really got welcomed to being a head coach when we went to Florida State, and they were loaded. And Coach Ham, they were loaded that year. They had multiple pro, which he always does. But we went down there, and I don't ever sit down. I've never sit down one second of a game that I've been the head coach. I stand the whole time, probably squat sometimes. But they – they came out and they absolutely throttled us. I mean, it'd be, I think it was 65. I mean, it'd be just by 65. They put in their second unit and they couldn't miss. There's pros on the second unit, probably like seven NBA players on that team or something. I remember Terrence Mann, who's an NBA like dude now, you know, he's the mainstay. He, he was like their eighth man or something. So that was my welcome to coach because you couldn't get away. That's the thing about being a head coach is as an assistant, you can just kind of crumble into that bench and, you know, all right, we're getting drilled here. Okay. The head coach can't do that. Like you got to keep coaching and you got <laughs> to try to get out of it. And that was the first time as a head coach, I was like, Oh my God, this, this 40 minutes feels like it's been 40 days. And um, I was glad to get out of Tallahassee. I said that in the presser. I remember going to the presser and they asked me about it. And I said, what, what, how this would help us moving forward? And I said, the number one way that this will help us is we don't have to play Florida State again. And I, and I, <laughs> I, I, I ain't played them since. <laughs> since I've been a head coach, I haven't played those guys since. Oh, man, that's awesome. Well, give us the uh, kind of your moment at South Alabama. What, what's, what's kind of been your, you know, I know you've had some, some good success early and obviously you had the championship at Nichols and you've had a lot of runs, but. Give us your one, maybe, you know, your hang hang your hat on right now at South we've, Alabama. We've had, you know, we we play in in my opinion, I think I think it's fact is we play in the toughest one bid league in the country. Um, I don't mm -hmm. care. We got 14 teams and it's an absolute bear, you know. Mm -hmm. And we've we've averaged, I think, 20 wins a year in like 19.7 or something, 19.4. Uh, so the consistency piece has been good. You know, and I, I my kids are are really good golfers and we do a lot of golf. Um, so I, I put coaching in terms of this a lot of times, you know, you're trying to make the cut every single year, just like golf, you're trying to make the cut. And then if you make enough cuts, you're trying to win, win you a major, which would be going to the NCAA tournament, winning the conference tournament. So that's my approach to a lot of it. And we made the cut every year. We've done a nice job of being consistent. I think in year two, when COVID shut everything down, we hadn't lost in 40, 40 days. We'd won like, eight, nine straight, and we were in the semifinals headed to New Orleans. And I think we we probably would have got it done. I mean, we were playing at a high level. 
And then last year we went to the, we went to the championship game, had a three go in and out um, mm -hmm. session away against Louisiana. Um, so we've been right there. I think the big thing for us here is the consistency and the culture piece we really have great kids here. We've won consistently in a league. That's very tough to do that. We've not had one of those years where we just, you know, kind of just died. You know, we've, we've, we've fought, had some years where we've been, you know, had to fight late and make these runs to, to have a good season. So I think that's what we've hung our hat on, to be honest with you. And hope, hopefully we can win one of these majors before too long. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're winning a lot of games and we're graduating our guys. We've had guys making a ton of money playing professionally, which is probably the most rewarding thing that I'm able to do outside of them getting their degrees. Um, so it's, it's been a blast. I'm telling you, I, I'm so, I'm so appreciative to be the head coach here. Um, again, you, you've heard my whole journey here and the fact that I get to be the head coach at South Alabama is it amazes me all the time, how fortunate I've been. And I'm thankful for all the people that have helped me along the way and given me opportunities. Well, one of the neat things I've, I've seen is uh, obviously met you when you were assistant at uh, Eastern Kentucky and all the moves you made, but, guys have said to me constantly that are in league with you that your teams are always one of the best late they always get better always get better always get better and uh that's been kind of your you know from their eyes what they see which is an unbelievable compliment you know because that kind of sticks with what you're saying and I think a lot of that goes back to what this show is about you're a guy that uh you know like like the hosts here you know our dads didn't coach we didn't play high major and you just got to Get in where you where you don't fit in sometimes, and you've been able to, you've been able to do that with the with the best of them, man, which is awesome. That's so now, like it. now, now, like your your team's getting better at the end. We're we're near the end here. We do lightning round, and we'll ask you uh, uh, two to three questions a piece. Uh, shot clock will come on now uh, a little quicker than uh, than normal, but at the same time, if you got a side bar story, we'll let you run with it because we we love the stories, but. Uh, we'll call, try to call shot time out. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm ready to run. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do my best to keep it short. We got shot clock going. I, I'll do my best to make sure I squeeze off the shot in time. Yeah, and we'll go with the uh, rebound that goes back that resets at 20. So we'll keep that rule. <laughs> we'll keep that rule. Some of the high schools don't. We'll go with the college version. So I'll, I'll start it off here. I'm a foodie, so I'm going to go with the food question right away. Just jump into it. Uh, you've been at all these places. G give me your uh, all-star lineup at uh, lunch stops. Uh, yeah, the maybe maybe one for every spot, real quick. Where where you go when you were at work? Where you would go and eat if you had lunch that day? Where where was your favorite place to go in yeah. Hawaii? And, in, you know, in Hawaii, in Hawaii, Murphy's Pub. Um, coach Glanville, a, a story football coach, used to be down there all the time. Um, they used to be in the NFL. I used to go down there to Murphy's Pub. is a little Irish spot. Great sandwich. Wow. Um, Pikeville, there's a place called Mona's. Home cook, like meal of the day, like as country as it gets, you know, meatloaf, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> we used to eat there all the time. Um, Eastern Kentucky and coastal, pretty mainstream. Not anything that I really jump out necessarily, you know, just normal. Um at UAB, they had some good places we used to go. Um, it's hard to pinpoint just one. Um, the place that sticks out, though, the most is a place called Bubba's in Thibodeau, Louisiana. And when you talk about food and you get down into Louisiana, the Cajun food, the seafood, oh, my goodness. I, I probably put on about 15, 20 pounds. But we used to eat at Bubba's <laughs> all the time, man. We'd go in there, get that crawfish, any type of seafood you wanted. Um, my wife didn't love it because it was mostly fried and she's, she wants me to eat a little bit healthier, but it was, um, that, that, that one, that one takes the cake. Bubba's in Thibodeau, Louisiana. I love it. I love it. What about where you're at now in South Alabama? Where's your spot? You have a lunch spot? It hurts somebody's feelings if I say so. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I do have a lot of different ones, but I don't want to go on record because I, I don't want them to know. You know, one, one place I love it, I got to give my guy a shout out is Chef Saki's. It's right down across from, from our university. He, he, he cooks back there. Um, you watch it live too, hibachi style unbelievable sushi but he wears a south alabama visor and he watches every one of our games oh i love it and um 
so we we I'm a I'm a frequent visitor there. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of really good food here. The seafood I like to coach close to the water because that's where this good seafood's at, and um, like it don't get it. much better than down this way. All right, all right, all right. I'm gonna ask one more, and then I'll let let the other guys go here. What's what's the um, the uh, point in your coaching career now? You 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 know your Division One head coach. You know probably go most places. People know who you are. What's what's a point where you've kind of been humbled a little bit, where you've been brought back? Maybe a they thought you were the, you know, the mailman or the girls coach at somewhere or whatever. What, what's the story where you got humbled a little bit after you thought you had arrived? It happens more than you think. A lot of times, <laughs> you know, I, what, I get humbled a lot because I, I caddy for my kids in these golf tournaments and my oldest now, my nine-year-old, he plays in, you know, all across the country. He plays in the worlds and the nationals. I mean, he's one of the best nine-year-old golfers in the country. So I'll go and, you know, I'll have my burn the boats on or South Alabama, you know, and I'm used to people like at least for the most part, knowing, you know, I'm a coach. They may not know anything about our team or might not know, you know, but out there, I'm like Reese's dad, you know, I, I'm just like <laughs> yeah, Reese's dad. It's, it's funny because that in that, in that, those circles out there, it's more about that. They don't, yeah. a lot of people don't watch basketball. So it's like, it's funny. They'll say stuff, random stuff about, you know, a parent will be like, yeah, you know, I wish I knew somebody in college athletics where I could find out how to, I'm sitting there thinking, dude, I've worked all over the country. Like you don't go down the coach. Um, yeah. But, no, but with me, I find a way into my way, like it all the time of being humbled. I think, I think that's the Lord's way to keep me humble. I, I've been in a lot of those situations where they didn't know who I was and, and I don't mind. I don't have any, any type of arrogance of anything, you know, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just glad I get to be a basketball coach, whether anybody knows it or not. It's, it's not my problem. I'm just glad to be here. That's awesome. Very glad to be here. All right. Some more coaches uh, questions here. You talked about Villa seven. What was the best question or the toughest question that came out of that, that came out of interviews with Cliff Ellis or at Clemson? What's one of those questions that you've used later with um, some of your people? Yeah, when, the toughest question for me in those settings is when somebody asks you to name your weaknesses because, you know, you're thrown into this thing. Like, what if one of your weaknesses is like a, a, a hard no for them, you know? So you don't want to divulge something that's going to cost you getting the job right then and there. Correct. So I, um, I, I, I ask guys that just to see what they'll say. I don't have any hard no's, but, you know, at all, at probably – half of those interviews they happen to ask me that one of the toughest things though real quick at villa seven you know what they would do they would take each year like their five guys they thought were ready to be a head coach and they would take you in and you would have those five guys and they would do like a session for interviewing to help you become a better interviewer and then they would have all these ADs, like five of them, some big time ADs, and they would do a mock interview with you in the room. You'd put a suit on and they would video it. And I remember watching after I did that, just how brutal my interview was. <laughs> that was terrible. And I was sitting there thinking like, how in the world are you ever going to get a job? You look like an absolute doofus sitting here with your body language, your mannerisms, how you're talking, like just... And that helped me tremendously because I fixed a lot of my problems. It's just like we do with our players with film. <laughs> you know, that the only way they can see themselves messing up is to sit there and see it on film broken down. And that helped me. Great call. Yep. Yep. What was one of the, the <laughs> to use your term, what was one of the doofus moves or, or some of the things that you corrected? You remember something you're willing my, to share? My posture was terrible. I was sitting there like I was sitting at, daggone Bubba's in Thibodeau, Louisiana, just relax. <laughs> I was, I was let back like this. And th I was like, man, you, you look like a, a lunatic out here, man. Like sit up, get your shoulders up. Yeah. And, and then a lot of things that you would say, you know, that you would say in casual conversation don't belong in an interview. Mm -hmm. And as a young guy, again, I was like 30 years old, 31 years old, whatever it was. I I didn't quite understand. I hadn't put all that together yet. So that was instrumental in me being able to be prepared to interview for some of these head coaching jobs. 
And um, that, I think That's if I didn't go through that, I, I would not have been ready. Yeah. Film your interview or the mock interview. Okay. Hey, yeah. rapid fire, Richie, book that you recommend or is on your nightstand now, podcast that you listen to, what are you learning all your stuff from? What are a couple ones you can recommend? I'm not good at that. Somebody asked me that this morning on a radio show that I got. I'm not good at that. I, I don't, I'm not an avid reader or an avid podcast guy. And a lot of coaches are, I think I'm the minority in that. A lot of guys do a ton of that. Um, and I don't, I don't. So what do you, what do, you do when you're driving across the state of Alabama into Mississippi for recruiting? Are you listening uh, to music? Are you on the phone with your kids? I'm on that phone recruiting. That's part of the most valuable part. That's why I drive everywhere. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't fly hardly anywhere um, because I value that time to be on the phone. And then I'm listening to some music. I like all, I like all genres of music other than heavy metal. I love country music. I love rap music, R and B, some old rock. Uh, I'm very diverse in my music, but yeah, I'm on the phone a lot. I like to be on that phone. Talking hey, productive. About yeah, makes sense. Uh -huh. Listen, um, we we can guess that you are a spectacular caddy. How good is your golf game if you take on your nine year old? So I used to be, I used to golf all the time. I never was great, but I used to be able to keep it in the mid to high eighties. You know, just enough to go out and play with some boosters and do that. So I quit playing golf though when I had kids, and so I don't play anymore. I'll hit a ball or two out there with them messing around, but. I focus all my energy on them getting better and me mm. being a caddy. And um, I, I do have an impressive record. You know, I think I like to think it has to do with the caddy, but it probably has to do with more of those little guys swings than it does me giving them information, but I take it really serious. People don't understand like youth golf at that level is pressure packed. I mean, those events are that. major for kids. Like we're getting ready to go to the worlds in a couple of weeks, which is the best nine and 10 year olds in the world. I mean, you're coming from everywhere. So I've already been studying the yardage book and the greens and, you know, kind of putting a plan together and we'll get down there, play a couple practice rounds and, and get ready to go to battle, man. Two day tournament, 36 holes. That's big time. That, see, that's fantastic. That's a great story there. And you get to spend the time with your kids. That's really important. I love it. I love it. It's awesome. It's been a, it's been a heck of a blessing. We live out on a golf course. So when I get done with work, when I get off here with you guys and do a few more things around the office, we'll be out there tonight at the facility, um, getting ready. My six-year-old's got a 10 and under tournament tomorrow. Um, so we got to fine tune a couple of things, get ready to try to go compete with them older kids. Well, we'll let you get out to the golf course here in a second. Bowles wrap us up with a couple quick lightnings and then right. uh, we'll, we'll hit the links. Last two, I'll, I'll make them kind of quick I, I might you might not want to answer this one but all right we've been hawaii we've been coastal carolina we've been south alabama are we pacific atlantic or the gulf which one's the best it's definitely the gulf yeah uh, yeah. That's, that's, yeah you had to go there definitely the gulf um uh, the most beautiful beaches there are man yeah it, it's beautiful and it's and we, and we enjoy it you know having kids is the best to be close to the beach where you can get there and Thank and and it doesn't get much better for golf than down here. My kids play year round. That's a heck of an advantage when we're we're trying to train to be to be the best. So it's better than the lakes of Kentucky. <laughs> no, that's <was, laughs> a good time. I had some good times on the lakes in Kentucky, though. That was my younger years. I had some real good times out there on the Memorial Day weekends at Laurel Lake, and that's where I'm from. And some of those lakes up there, we had some good times. All right, and the last one's it's a two parter. All right. The first part is the worst gym you've ever competed in player, coach, whatever. <laughs> and then the next one is the best gym or best atmosphere. The best I, I'll go best first. Um, it's hard to beat Cameron Endor. I've coached in there probably five or six times. Um, it's hard to beat that atmosphere. It's just nuts, man. Like it's hard to explain how crazy it is. Um, my all time favorite game that I coached in probably was against Jay Wright in the Wachovia and Villanova the year that they won it. Um, mm -hmm. Corey, Corey's guy, Quay Smith, had 26 points. Um, when, yeah. uh, but Jay Wright has always <laughs> that was, been that was right. Yeah, I Jay, watched that game. I watched yeah, that game. Jay Wright and Kelvin Sampson probably are my two like 
guys that I look up to more than anybody. Um, and yeah. so coaching cool. against me right in that setting was really cool. Some of the worst gyms, I mean, I've coached in some pretty rough <laughs> gyms, especially – you know, back in my NAIA days, <laughs> we've got we've got a list of them, especially in the South. We, I'm not going to name it, but there's a school in Kentucky that I coached at, and we literally had to change outside. Like the locker rooms were down or whatever, so we changed. It was pitch dark. We changed <laughs> outside. There's like three rows in the gym, and there was like almost a melee in there. And I remember just being so thankful on that bus ride home that we got out of there alive that we didn't end up on CNN. Um, and I've had a few of those weird, crazy stories like that. And, and that's what you get. You guys know that when you coach at every single level of basketball, you, in, you, in, you just find yourself in these situations where it, you would have to be there to believe it. And um, I've had a lot of those. I didn't have many of those at Clemson, and I don't have many. <laughs> that year, but when I dial back to those days, there's a lot of them. I love it. I love it. Well, hey, before we close out, is there anything – you would like to close it with anybody, you, you know, anything you want to cover that we didn't or anything you want to say? No, you guys did a great job. I really enjoyed it. I, you know, I had, I'd had practice and had a bunch of stuff going on this morning. So this was a nice treat to be able to come on here and, and talk and laugh and have a good time with, with some guys I know love ball just as much as I do. Um, so I appreciate y'all having me on and I'm, um, I'm grateful for the friendship and, and the opportunity to go in here and talk to you guys. That's awesome. Well, you know, it's I, I heard this story originally sitting in a little barbecue joint right outside of Waycross after you came down and watched this practice. And I knew this would be a when we started this podcast, I knew your story fit off the beaten path, maybe better than anybody. Uh, so I appreciate you taking time to do it. And I know right before recruiting starts, it's tough. So I really appreciate it. And uh, we, we loved having you on. I, I bowls. Tell us where they can find us online and all that fun stuff and we'll close it out and let uh coach get on back at it and playing golf tonight right um coach thanks for being on it was, it was fun and I, I was gonna guess the school in kentucky i've played a lot of the d3s and nais in kentucky but i'm not i'm not gonna put them out there like that don't put them on blast i'll get email, i'll get emails and twitter ads and everything else i'm staying away from that yeah i won't put me out there but uh but for the for those that are listening uh you can follow us on twitter at off beaten path underscore all right awesome and hey this has been a show for those who uh want to coach those who are coaches those who used to coach those who follow coaches those who hire and fire the coaches and hopefully we didn't scare anybody away from wanting to be a coach and uh we appreciate you <laughs> we appreciate you and tune in thank you again rich thank you guys